Hi everybody, welcome to session 3.3. .3. We're going to be talking about formatting issues. A lot of this will have to do with text, but not all of it. But this isn't so much about basic typography like body text. This is a lot to do with specially formatted text. And so we're going to re revisit the rules of good design. Then we're going to talk about these various formats of text that tend to be special from body text. And then we're going to talk about just other sort of general format guidelines. You remember we talked about various rules of design early in the semester, in fact, on the second day of class. Um, I want to remind you of three of those rules. First is this idea of negative space, that you want to leave room around your message to help your reader focus on it. You're going to see a lot of these guidelines I give you today will, will emphasize the importance of, of white space. Um, the same goes for placement. Where you put things on a document matters a lot. Um, naturally we're all drawn to the upper left corner of every page we pick up and that's the product of training over time. It's that way for Westerners, it's not that way for people in Asia or other parts of the world, but it's how it works for us here and uh, placement matters a lot to help you get your message across and I'll show you examples of that. And then finally is this idea of affordance where you give the, the reader obvious cues to invite them how to proceed and, and also to give them context to know where they are within a message. Okay, so uh, I want to start off by asking an interesting question. You know, why do we still use paper? Um, a lot of you may be asking that question yourselves, especially because we're doing a lot of this course online, so, so why am I teaching all these conventions that are used for print? Well, we still use paper all the time, and, 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 and it's important that we preserve these typographical and formatting rules that make printed documents look nice. If you think about it, paper does things that electronic formats still don't do for us. One is this idea of annotation. <clears throat> it's a lot easier to jot some notes on a piece of paper than it is to pull up a document and use a PDF reader and insert a comment. It, it's just a lot, in, in, in a circumstance where you have paper in front of you, it's simpler in many cases to just make a note. Uh, a lot of you might do this with the books you read, for example. In fact, some of you are probably holdouts with the whole e-reader movement where people are reading on devices instead of paper. You know, you probably love books because you can write in them. And this is a convention that electronic formats, or this is a use that electronic formats haven't been able to take away yet or replicate. Um, another reason is because paper is an artifact and we like artifacts. We like holding things in our hands. Something that's been beautifully printed that's handed to you in a meeting feels like it's important. Um, a beautifully designed document on the screen of an iPad for some reason doesn't have the same weight as a beautifully printed document that's being given to you in a meeting. And so the artifact nature of paper matters a lot to us. And then finally, paper is easier for collaboration. Think about it, if you're in a meeting where everybody has the same copy of a report, you can easily glance at what other people are reading in the report and know what's going on, but unless you're staring at the screen of their iPad, you may not know what they're reading in um, a meeting where everybody's using electronic formats. And so paper is also simpler for collaboration because it, it's, it's an easier signaling mechanism to other people as to what's going on and where people are reading in, a me in the document. So there are a lot of reasons we keep paper, and to the extent that's true, it's important that we format it right. Okay, so let's talk about some rules, especially formatted text, and we're going to start off by talking about headings. We talked briefly about headings in the last class session. I, I want to quote Butterick here. He says that headings are signposts for readers that reveal the structure of your argument, and I emphasize with italics the word signposts and the word argument for a reason, because that really summarizes the whole point of, of headings. It's all about all about giving people signposts to better understand your argument. And every paper really has an argument, even if the goal is to inform, that's, that's in a sense, the argument of the paper is to inform. And so, in fact, you're not going to do very much of that. Most of the stuff you write will be persuasive in nature, so you'll definitely have an argument in your paper. Um, let me give you an example. We're going to walk through sort of the design process of a heading to get it just right. All right, here's my text, and I've got a heading in there. If you're having a hard time seeing it, I don't blame you. It's because I haven't really distinguished it. Now, I did give you a rule last week, last time that said to always use a sans serif font for headings. Well, I've done that here, but, but that wasn't enough. It's still not very visually distinctive. And so um, that's not the only problem, though. It's also really vague. Remember, Butterick said that it's, it's, about a sign, it's not just about being a signpost, but it's also about the structure of your argument. Well, the word introduction has nothing to do with my argument. 
this is a kind of a ridiculous heading that people use all the time, but it doesn't accomplish much. If, if, if I'm reading at the beginning of document, I assume it's the introduction, so a, a heading telling me that doesn't help. Instead, I should have something descriptive like the current challenge. Once I change to that, I'm giving an introduction with context from the very beginning. At the moment I start reading, I know that I'm going to be reading about a challenge, something that's challenging to, to the group involved with this document, but also that this challenge is current, that it's an issue that's at hand, not something in the past or something we might face in the future. This heading is descriptive. It's also brief, and that's another advantage uh, of, of the heading, and so I'm keeping it brief, but I'm also being descriptive. It's a lot better than the heading, than, than the heading that says just introduction. I'm giving a sense of the structure of my argument. Okay, but this still isn't good enough. We're not quite there. We can do other things to make it more visually distinctive. Uh, I can make the font bigger. That helps a little bit. Now, I don't want to make the font too big, but this is pretty good. That's not too far away from the text already. Uh, still, it doesn't quite stand out as much as I'd like, so let's try something else. I'm going to bold it. Now, that looks a lot better. In fact, that probably looks like something that you'd find professionally printed. So so this is pretty good, but what if I need, feel like I need to emphasize it even more? One thing that a lot of people do with headings is they do the headings in all capital letters. That's this. That does not look as good. Uh, in fact, this looks like I'm being shouted at. This is an increasingly troublesome convention. Uh, it used to be the case that all caps wasn't nearly as big of a deal as it is now. But these days, in, in text messages and email messages, using all capital letters implies shouting. Like it's, it's, it's like you're yelling at the person. And you don't want to do that with headings. You don't want it to be the current challenge. You just want it to be the current challenge. And so, so all capital letters is a convention that should go away because of the, because of the, the nature of, of uh, the shouting implication that comes from modern text messaging and emailing. So with that in mind, let's let me show you. And the, and the truth is, it's overdoing the emphasis. Even if I take out the bold and I leave it all caps, it still feels like I'm shouting. Plus, it makes it less visually distinctive. So let's go back to where we had it before, where it just says the current challenge. Um, another way you can distinguish your headings is by changing the alignment of the headings. Here I'm going to center it. Um, you'll notice that this is a problem because, th like I said, the, the eyes of Western readers are always drawn to the top left corner of a page. If the heading is off of that position, then I have to go find it. And you don't want people to have to go find what they need to read, especially because headings are supposed to be useful. You know, imagine if you were uh, driving along the highway and the important signs were all in the median rather than on the right-hand side of the road. That's an, we, we are accustomed to signs being on the right-hand side of the road, and if they stuck things like the speed limit and posted it in the median of the road, we'd have a harder time uh, finding and paying attention to those signs. So let's take it back on the left because in reading that's where we go is top left. All right, so I'm, I'm good with that heading. I'm going to leave it the way it is. What I need next is a subheading, though, because I have more material following that's under this idea of the current challenge, and subheadings help me introduce more structure to my argument. <clears throat> so I'm going to insert this subheading of budget cuts. Now, if you look at it and go, wait, is that really a subheading? Um, that's natural, because in this case, you can't really tell. I formatted my subheading the exact same as my heading, and so it looks like a second main heading, not a subheading to the first heading. And so I need to visually distinguish subheadings from main headings. Um, I, I could do this again with placement. A really common tactic is to indent a subheading. Um, I think that's got the same problem with centering a heading. It takes it off alignment. It feels not quite right. Let's stick it back where it belongs on the left. Um, you know, probably the best approach is to make typographic changes. Let's just take the bolding out. Uh, and that already looks better. So. So here I've got a good main heading, I've got a clear subheading, and I'm in pretty good shape. If I follow this convention all the way through my paper, where the main headings are bolded and that font size, and the subheadings are not bolded at the same font size, this is going to help my reader find their way. Um, large documents, though, might be more problematic, especially if you're using headings as references. So you might want to be able to tell somebody to go to a particular section in the document uh, you may not want to use the page number. You might want to use go to section 3, right? 
Well, in that case, you'll need to number your headings. Um, the convention with numbering headings has always kind of been Roman numerals followed by letters. Um, from that, we'd get sort of mini Roman numerals, and then we get mini le like lowercase letters and so on down the chain. Uh, this is a convention that breaks down really quickly and gets confusing really quickly because if you have a large document with lots of headings, then you get stuff that looks like this. I mean, look at that main heading. What would you tell somebody just quickly what heading that was? Would you call it XVI? Would you call it heading 16, which incidentally is what Roman numeral what is what Roman numeral that is? No, that just doesn't work. And so, and, and the same is true of letters. I mean, which letter in the alphabet, number-wise, is the letter J? I, I don't know. I'd have to count with my hands to figure out what letter letter J is. And so the problem here is that these this let, this um, <coughs> numbering convention for headings doesn't work. The, the best convention, I think, is this simple 1.1.1 convention where the first number is the main level of headings. The second number is the first level of subheading, and the third number would be the, the sub-subheadings. Um, <clears throat> the nice, the other nice thing about this convention is it's easy to find your way. So if you refer somebody to section 1.13, they can easily find it. It's a lot less confusing. Um, and uh, it's also easier for you to keep track of where you are as you're, pr as you're putting in those headings. Um, th the, uh, there are some just really simple rules on, on uh, headings to summarize with. One, use brief descriptive headings. Secondly, use at most three levels of headings. Um, if you're going to distinguish levels, right, so you have main headings and subheadings, you should prefer font changes over placement to distinguish those headings. So make changes to the font before you decide to indent any headings to make them look distinct. And then finally, only number headings when necessary, and if you do, use the 1.1.1 convention. You'll notice this is the convention I used for my for my. Uh, class schedule. So right now we're in unit uh, 3, right, and this is class session 3.3. Uh, and what that does for you is it tells you that it makes it easier for you to find these class sessions. Um, <clears throat> don't use combinations of numerals, letters, and numbers. Those are, just get confusing. Okay, let's move on and talk about lists, because lists also deserve special formatting. Lists are great. In fact, I think lists are underused in writing. And the reason they're underused is because people don't think in lists enough. But lists are a really convenient way to, to help somebody understand, A, that the items in a list are all related to each other. B, lists often have a, 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 um, a progression that helps the reader follow along. And C, lists have an internal organization and, and that uh, helps the reader to uh, to, uh, to know where they are and where they're going. Notice that I just gave you a list. And uh, I'd encourage you to use lists in your writing more often. Um, I'm, I'm going to pretend. I, here I've, I've rewritten the prompt so that the document, so that it is kind of setting me up for a list. I, at the end of that first paragraph, I say, three reasons deserve attention. It implies the list is coming. So let's make the list first by putting in some numbers. Um, you'll notice that doesn't actually help very much. Uh, the formatting here doesn't really emphasize that it's a list. In fact, it looks really condensed and, and hard to distinguish. One thing that helps is indenting lists. So you sort of move a list in um, from the left that creates a gap that where I know that I'm finding something different. It emphasizes a list by indenting it. Uh, the numbers still are way too crowded. So for lists, I really ought to separate the numbers through indenting the text. Um, the numbers stand out on their own, and it makes it easier for me to appreciate the list and, f and know when I've come to the end of it also. Um, I don't have to use numbers. I can use bullets. Bullets are great, um, but just don't, please, use bullets that look like this or this or this. Um, and, and, and please, whatever you do, don't use bullets that look like this. Don't use images for bullets. Um, the, the reason is because all of those bullets just distract. They don't emphasize meaning. They don't convey different meaning than a regular bullet would. Uh, you might be inclined to use them because you think they look fancy, but fancy isn't what your message is about. Your message is about the message itself. Um, you can do a lot more by making your document fancy with good typography than by using ridiculous looking bullets. So stay away from that stuff. Go with simple bullets if you're going to have a bulleted list. Uh, there's one final formatting change you can make that helps a lot, especially if your lists contain paragraphs or multiple paragraphs. 
you can do you can bold the topic sentence or italicize the topic sentence of the first paragraph to help people know what the list that list item is about what's really useful about this formatting convention is that as i look at it i could just read the topic sentences and know what the list is about okay so in formatting lists make sure first that lists don't span multiple pages people forget that they're in a list if you do that um, so keep your list relatively short slightly indent lists to make them visually distinct from the text also indent and align the text in a list so that the number or the bullet stands out like i showed you um, don't use distracting or large bullets or numbers and finally if you're going to be using a list with paragraphs consider emphasizing the topic sentence of the paragraph with bolding or italics all right let's talk about block quotes uh, block quotes are another specially formatted text that helps the reader know what's going on in the document just by looking um, here I've rewritten the text so that it reads as a quote from an op-ed that was in the Daily Picayune. Um, you can, technically it's correct to just use quotations around multiple paragraphs, but the problem is that it doesn't help the reader know that that's what's going on. This is a convention in fiction writing, so you see that uh, in fiction writing dialogue is, is just indicated with quotation marks, but in Nonfiction writing, this actually isn't that helpful, um, especially because it, it confuses the voice. Uh, in fiction, it's easy to tell who's the narrator and who's not. In nonfiction, that's not always clear <clears throat> because what's being quoted isn't actually dialogue. It's not a conversation. Um, and it, in fact, oftentimes a quoted text will read just like the, the, regular, the rest of the text. And so we need to visually distinguish a block quote so it's clear that it's not the author that, that wrote this. Um, indenting again is a great way to emphasize block quotes this is a really common convention to indent block quotes uh, the problem here is that it still isn't visu that visually distinct uh, let's shrink the font size that helps a lot and that's also shortened the line length so sorry the line spacing so the gaps between lines is short is smaller the font is also smaller and this has visually distinguished my block quote a lot a lot better than what i had before um, once I've made these changes, I don't need quotation marks anymore. I can take those out because the, the, the formatting changes have implied a quotation, so I don't need quotation marks. Um, but there is another problem with this, which is that the block quote is simply too long. Um, it's really easy to use long block quotes because of laziness. Um, you need to do some work for the reader. Readers actually tend to skip block, long block quotes, and so you should condense the block quote like I did here, where I took out sort of the highlights and put it into a shorter block quote where it'll be easier and more interesting for the reader. So always indent block quotes, remove quotation marks from around the quote, um, slightly shrink the type size and the line spacing, and avoid long block quotes. Readers tend to skip them. Okay. Uh, you might need to use footnotes or endnotes if you're using a lot of references or if there are other sort of uh, parenthetical statements that you want to add that don't belong in the body of your text. Um, to the extent that's true, here are some useful questions and answers. First, anytime you're considering either footnotes or endnotes, you should ask what the convention is for your audience. Whatever your audience is used to is what you should probably use. Um, if your boss insists on footnotes, then use footnotes. If your boss hates footnotes, then but wants endnotes, do that too. If you're in a profession that requires footnotes, like the law, uh, then use footnotes. Um, if there is no dominant convention, then the next question you should ask is how important is convenient access for the reader? If the reader doesn't really need to see the footnotes um, er, to, to appreciate the meaning, if there's not sort of extra information that, that, that carries important weight for the reader, then just stick the notes at the end, uh, at the end of the document. You'll see this a lot in nonfiction writing where there are a lot of references, uh, citations, um, explanations of, 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 you know, longer explanations of, of, of what was noted. Uh, endnotes are, are, are useful when the reader doesn't need to get to them right away. If the reader does need to get to them right away, then the higher, then it, so there's a higher importance to convenient access, then use footnotes. You should be aware, though, that uh, footnotes are not a convention that's available in things like e-readers. So if you ever plan on writing something that goes onto a Kindle, uh, Kindles and other electronic readers don't support footnotes, and they only use endnotes, and so that's something to keep in mind. Finally, um, 
the, there is another important question. If your notations only contain references, meaning there's not additional information, it's simply citations to source material, then we'll first follow convention. That's the first rule. But if there is no convention, use inline references and then a list of references at the end of the document. So this isn't quite an endnote, but instead you would use a citation method like you might see with APA or Chicago where you, you know, in a parenthetical indicate the author and year. And then at the end of the document, you just do an alphabetical list of all the references that were used in the paper. Make sure, however, whatever citation method you use, use one that's generally accepted like APA or Chicago. Don't use your own sort of makeshift citation method. Some other formatting tips if you're using footnotes um, or endnotes, you should always use a superscript for footnotes, for footnote or endnote numbers. Um, so like you'll notice I have that a little one there and a little two that's floating above the baseline. Um, all, uh, word, uh, all word processing software can do superscript like that. Um, and then also if you're doing footnotes at the bottom of the page, use smaller text for the font size. Uh, avoid hard to read fonts for footnote text because you're making it smaller. Don't use weird fonts, um, but use simple fonts that are highly readable at small font sizes. And then finally, use numbers, not symbols, for footnotes and endnotes. It's tempted, like there's an old convention where you'd use like a section symbol and then an asterisk and then a cross and then all these, all these sort of symbols. And then you'd start stacking the symbols if you had a lot. So you'd have two section symbols and then two crosses. And um, that's just, just terrible. And uh, it's a convention that gratefully has not really survived today. You might see older stuff that's written that way, but today footnotes should always be numbered. Okay, let's talk a little bit about headers and footers. I think Butterick's example is a great way to use footers. Um, on the left-hand side, the old academic styling of the paper just has one page number right in the middle. Um, that may not be as useful for large documents. Let's take a closer look at what Butterick gave us on the right. Um, you see, what he did is he provided some sort of reference to the topic at that's currently on the page. So this would be a, a paper, the title of the paper or maybe this, this section or main heading that you're currently in, uh, in the paper. And then also the page numbers. And you'll notice he did page one of, which uh, is an affordance to the reader so they know how long they have to be reading this paper. Um, just some formatting tips on headers and footers. Uh, Butter it calls them background, which is a great way to describe them. These are sort of things that you only put there to provide sort of a sense of place. They're not there to provide anything more than that. So uh, use a smaller font size. Make sure it's still readable. You'll notice that Butterick used all caps to make the font more readable at a small font size. Don't put headers or footers on title pages or on tables of contents. Only put them on pages that contain body text. And again, remember the purpose, this is all about affordance. The only reason headers and footers exist is to help people find out where they are in the document and where they're going. Okay, so let's finish up by talking about some visual formatting stuff. I want to blow your mind for a second. Page size is an arbitrary constraint. What I have on the left there are common page sizes used in the publishing industry for books. Um, and you'll notice not a single one of them is 8.5 by 11, which is the dominant uh, prevailing page size in, in the business world and in the academic world. Now, that's a convenience. There's a convenience in having everybody use 8.5 by 11 because when I print it out from my printer, it looks like it's intended. It, when I'm filing it away, I have file folders that are, that are sized to accept 8.5 by 11 documents. But you don't have to use them. Now realize, if you're going to deviate, you might be causing an inconvenience, but you also might be emphasizing your message. You can. The truth is that any print shop can custom cut page sizes, so always consider it an option for the things that you're preparing. Now don't do it when it's an annoyance, but remember, you get all kinds of stuff in the mail, you get all kinds of pamphlets handed to you on the street, you get... Um, you get all sorts of different page sizes given to you and they emphasize communication. They emphasize the message if they're done right anyway. And so don't be stuck on 8.5 by 11. Always make sure that you consider alternative page sizes an option for communicating your message. Okay, now let's presume, however, that we're going forward with an 8.5 by 11 page size because of convention and convenience. One of the things that matters is how you create your margins. Um, here, I wanted to illustrate a principle, which is that your margins don't have to be symmetrical. Um, I've got a, a left-leaning page. I've got a centered page. I've got a right-leaning page. And you'll notice that all three of them look pretty good. 
it doesn't really matter what convention I use it's as long as I'm consistent about that so all of my pages should have the same margins running down but I can do left-leaning centered or right-leaning text um, the point is I also have really big margins that give lots of white space and also give me the right line length and so in a typical 8.5 by 11 document with 11 to 12 point font, my advice is that you use a total of 4 inches for side margins. So if I add up the left and right margins, I should get 4 inches. Avoid side margins that are smaller than 1.5 inches. Those margins will be too small and the text will be crowding the side of the page. Also avoid margins that are larger than 2.5 inches. Um, that just makes it look like you're really wasting a bunch of paper on that side of the page. Also, if you monkey around too much with those dimensions, you'll mess up your line length, and you should always be sure to use margins that give you the right line length. Ultimately, that is the golden rule when it comes to margins, is that you get the right line length out of your margins. But here I've got two pages that are next to each other where the where instead I'm not consistent necessarily. It's, it might look like I'm not consistent. In reality, I am. These are facing pages. Anytime you're printing a document to give to somebody, your default behavior should be to print front and back, meaning you're creating facing pages. Um, you know, the stuff you get that's professionally printed is usually printed on both sides, um, especially multi-page documents. And so don't hand somebody or don't design a document that's intended for only printing on one side of the page. Also, it's a waste of paper. So what you need to do is create um, front and back pages in the way you print. Now Word and all other word processors have um, tools built in to distinguish front and back pages. So for example, if I'm doing asymmetrical margins, then I can mirror the margins, which is what I should do. Um, so don't have, if you're printing front and back, don't have both pages shift to the left. Have both pages shift to the middle. That's, that, that's, the, that's the proper approach. And so instead of thinking left and right margins, having the same dimensions. Think of outside margins and inside margins having the same dimensions. So here I've made the, I pushed the text to the middle and uh, the margins are the same side on either side. The outside margins are the same, the inside margins are the same. Now also make sure that you leave plenty of space on the inside margins for binding. If you're going to use spiral binding or staple binding, make sure there's enough space so that your text doesn't get crowded or cropped. Okay, we're close to done. Um, the, the, there are there's a really great tool in every word processor which is a break feature where you can insert basically invisible characters that tell the word processor to go to the next page um, that's a page break you can put in another uh, you can also put in breaks for columns so if you're doing multi-column documents it sends text to the next column section breaks are these really cool things that that basically tell the word processor to apply different formatting rules for everything that follows a section break so you might have multi-column text on one page and then single column text on the next page uh, a, um, or, or the page numbering might change from Roman numerals to, to regular numbers um, th the point is that section breaks are the way you can create those the, the format you can create changes in formatting rules by using section breaks um, as far as breaks go, make sure you use page breaks to start major sections of a document on a new page. Um, don't run a new section uh, onto the bottom of a prior page, just insert a page break. You should also use page breaks to separate the title page of documents that have a title page. Do not, I repeat, do not use carriage returns by hitting the enter return key to start new pages. If you make changes to the text later, carriage returns will mess up the alignment and formatting of what you've written. So use page breaks instead of carriage returns to get new pages. Um, last, this is the last one. Let's talk about columns. Uh, you can use columns in eight and a half by eleven pages. In fact, in some in some cases they can look really good, but they're a little bit tricky. So be warned. Um, make sure that you change the margins to get the line length right. A lot of people make their columns too narrow where you only get maybe three or four words per, per line in a column. That doesn't look good. So make sure that you get a good and appropriate line length, 45 to 90 characters, in whatever size of the columns you use. Avoid columns for documents that have footnotes. Microsoft Word forces the, the, the footnotes into multiple columns if you use multiple columns in the body text and that just looks bad and is confusing. So if you're using footnotes, avoid avoid multiple columns. And then finally, remember that multiple columns sacrifice white space. So that's a trade-off. You might like the readability. It also create, gives you a chance to cram more text onto a page. But the result is you get less white space for your reader. Okay, that's it.